Hang on one sec. Ugh. It's been a rough past 48 hours or so. <laughs> Alright guys, listen. I'm gonna be real with you. This is gonna be a two-part video series, and part one was gonna be me racing this RC car at a local track, see how it performed, give you some quick comments, and then part two was going to be a very kind of like logical, rational breakdown of what it is and my thoughts on it. Well, <laughs> this hasn't gone according to plan. I'm gonna be real with you guys. I read through a lot of the comments and I received a lot of good criticism. My tone and choice of delivery for how I was going about talking about this came across as me being a elitist and kind of outing people who might really enjoy this vehicle. And you know what? You're right. I don't want that to be what the message is that I'm delivering. I just want to give an honest review of this vehicle and offer some perhaps better suggestions for people getting into racing. I'm gonna make you a deal, okay? I will give you a genuine formal apology at towards the end of this video if you would like to watch what I have to say about this vehicle in kind of like the uh, traditional review style that we normally have here on this channel. And we're going to go over to a local hobby shop and get some of their opinion on something like this and perhaps some alternatives for stuff that they've seen in the day to day when they work with this stuff. First, we're gonna pop the hood off of this thing, take a look, see what's in here, give you my thoughts, and then we'll head to the hobby shop, and then we'll come back, and um, I'll give you what I promise. Deal? Deal. Let's take a look at this thing and kind of run through the vehicle and see what we get for this $140 price point. So it comes assembled. Um, the wing isn't attached. You do have to put that on out of the box, but that's just two screws back here. But this is pretty much how it comes out of the box. Now, right off of the bat, the first thing I want to point out is that this uses a very uh, proprietary electronic system. And what I mean by that is that it's very difficult to interchange many of these pieces with something that's current on today's market. It's pretty much an all or nothing uh, upgrade should you choose to continue to use this vehicle with some better stuff. So let me show you some of these pieces and break it down. This is a very interesting ESC. It's not the highest quality or waterproof or anything like that. But the thing that really immediately gave me kind of like a uh, level of contention is that this plug system is very proprietary. So if you see the wires coming out of this servo, Ooh. the number of wires coming out of here, I'm not so sure if you guys can see this, I'm not exactly sure the interactions and how this wiring works between some of these components. For example, most servos today are going to be a standard three wire system and then just plugging into a three wire prong in a receiver. Well, this servo goes straight into the ESC. So it seems like they've kind of put the power and communication devices all inside of this ESC. It's behaving as both the speed controller and a receiver. And some of you might think that that's cool, but the problem that you run into here is that, for example, the first thing that you're gonna need to do on race day is oof, plug in a little two wire or three wire transponder. And that's going to have a standard, um, I don't know if you would call it like a J style or a Futaba style, um, plug. And so in order for this thing to count laps on the track, we're going to have to plug this in somewhere. And you can't do that. There is no plug in this system for it to do that. So the first and immediate issue you're going to run into is where's the receiver? Oh, I don't have one. How do I fix that? Oh, now I need to buy an entry level radio system if I want to plug in my transponder. Because more and more gone are the days where we use those old big 
brick style transponders that just kind of like sat in the vehicle with like a body clip. Um, we don't use that kind of system anymore. There may be some other options out there that aren't as common that you could get to work with a system like this, but the majority of lap counting systems out there with the, I believe it's like an AMB um, decoder system, it's just not gonna work immediately with this setup. So you can take it to the track, you can drive it around the track, but it's gonna be a little tricky when it comes to how are they actually gonna get you into the timing system. So first issue, this little ESC, ESC in one combo doesn't play nicely with pretty much anything that I know of on the market. So if you wanna upgrade the servo, you're gonna to have to upgrade to an ESC that has a traditional system with a receiver, and then you can upgrade to a brushless motor, etc. So right off of the bat, you're kind of, you can run it as it is and charge it up and just enjoy it like this. But if you want to take it to the track, you pretty much immediately have to get into a higher level electronic system just so that you can get some basic functionality with things like transponders. I had a little bit of PTSD when I saw this old fashioned closed end bell brushed motor. Um, this is some pretty old technology. This is something that pretty much all racers have done away with, except for there might be perhaps a few um, spec classes in the on-road world, I think, that might still use a closed-end bell motor like this, but they are definitely not fun. I don't like them. Uh, they're very slow. They overheat. They're just not very efficient. It's just not the system that you want to be using in today's racing environment. So, Definitely want to get that into a brushless system, but again, you're going to be forced with getting, got to get a motor, got to get an ESC. If you get the ESC, now you're going to need to get a radio system with the receiver and a new servo. So it's kind of like anytime you want to adjust one of these things, you have to go full wood, get into the whole deal. The only thing that I think that you can upgrade in this system as it sits is going to be this battery. Um, this battery, it barely lasted me for a five minute run. By the end of the run, the car was very slow and it was difficult to get over some of the basic jumps on the track. So if you can upgrade the battery to a larger milliamp, that's definitely going to be a big plus. Um, this one is 2200 milliamps as it comes. The other issue that you're going to run into with a kit like this is that on a typical race day, if you go to a club race, they're going to have probably anywhere from like 20 to 40 entries and you're going to have to charge this battery at least three times. If you're doing the bare minimum of two qualifiers and a main, you're going to have to run it a total of three times. Absolutely. If you want to do any additional practice, well, then that's going to be more battery charging that you're going to have to do. The wall charger that comes with this will definitely not charge this fast enough for most race days that I've seen. The timing and how frequent this battery has to be at full capacity, this just doesn't have that ability right out of the box. You're going to need a much better charger. So there, if you get... So if you get into that world and you're going to get a better charger, you're adding another like maybe 100 bucks or so to get something that's going to be able to charge a battery fast enough for people on race day. Now that we've gone through the electronics, I kind of want to talk about the capabilities of the vehicle itself. Um, it's a very interesting car because it does look a lot like something like a previous generation X-Ray or Yokomo or something that's somewhat current four-wheel drive platform. So they definitely looked at something and did their best to copy it. But when you get it in your hands and you, if you've compared it to something that is a top-level four-wheel, you can see that it's really just an imitation at best and it pretty much stops there. So for example, the spring package that they give you, uh, if we're looking at this in the context of what they were copying, they give you a car that has some carpet tires on it. Okay, so maybe they want you to run it on carpet. Well, it doesn't come with a sway bar system, even though it has a mounting system for sway bars. Um, the option parts list that I saw in the box didn't really show any part numbers for a sway bar system, but it's kind of there. So uh, maybe you could retrofit something to make it appropriate. I'm not really sure. The other thing is that the ride height on this vehicle, I checked it, is currently at 28 millimeters, which I don't know of any setup out there for a 10 scale vehicle where you would need that much ride height. Typically speaking, a four wheel drive vehicle is gonna be in the range of about 
let's say 18 to 20 for most dirt situations and then something as low as like 11 or 12 for a carpet or an astro setup the way that this spring sits you have your preload collars all the way up so if you wanted this car to have a lower ride height to keep it from traction rolling or something like that on a carpet track, you simply can't do it. It's just too high, it's going to be too bouncy, it's too stiff, it's just not going to work. So the suspension setup is a little bit deceiving because it looks cool with the red anodizing and the silver springs, but its functionality is basically a zero out of 10 as in the regards of is it a real racing setup. Now. Could you put some different springs on here to soften it up, drop it down? I'm sure you could do that and it wouldn't be that expensive. Now, you guys might be wondering what in the heck happened back here? So in the video where Lee was driving it, the last thing that he did, he drove the car for two laps, just two laps on his track. The first time that he crashed it, he bent this, yeah, I'll just pop it off. These things pop off way too easily. He just tapped the wall like we normally do in the back side of the track, and this thing just bent like a wet noodle. Um, it's pretty obvious that whatever they made this out of, cheap steel, not really sure, um, definitely not something that you would want to race with. Now, the other issue that when this happened, these folks used a like a floating style dog bone system where there's an outdrive on the diff and then there's an outdrive. Let me see if I can show you guys. There's an outdrive in the hub. Now you might be like, oh, Ryan, what's the big deal about that? Well, this is definitely going to be something that will happen to other people when these dog bones, maybe they don't bend, they just pop off. But if the wheel flops and then the dog bone goes flying and they don't find it, that's a problem. And then you're gonna have to be stuck trying to track something down like this. It's definitely not gonna be something that you'll find at your local hobby shop. You're gonna have to order it from the you know, Hong Kong website or whatever, and then wait a few weeks at minimum to get something back into your car to keep it running. So here's the thing about racing RC cars and why I'm going to such great lengths to say, hey, you might wanna avoid getting something like this. See something like this? This little transponder. These little guys cost about 120 bucks, 125 bucks retail, which is almost the purchase price of this whole entire vehicle. The cost of racing over the course of like a year or half a year or something like that is going to be way more expensive than most people think. Let me put it to you in terms that might make sense. Do you remember when you were a kid and you asked your parents, hey, can we get this doggy? <laughs> You're going by the pound and you saw a 4th of July special that all dogs adoption fees were $25 this week only, something like that, right? In my little kid brain, it's like, dad, it's only $25. What's the deal? Why are you being such a stinker and not letting me get this cool dog? Because your dad is very aware that whether that dog was $25 or $2,000, he's going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on that dog over the course of its lifetime. Now, obviously, RC cars are not living, breathing creatures and don't require the same level of moral obligation, but there is going to be a lifetime expense that is going to make the initial purchase price of this vehicle almost negligible when we're looking at the entire cost of the pie. If we were to break this down into what is the most expensive part about RC racing, the cost of the vehicle becomes a smaller and smaller and smaller slice of the pie. So if you're going to spend your hard earned dollars on this racing adventure, I want people to get the best racing experience possible for their money. Let me give you a sad and mildly heartwarming story of uh, a recent encounter I had at the track. So I was at the track and racing and we saw a new family there. There was a mom and her eight-year-old son. He had some sort of two-wheel drive truck, monster truck thing, not really sure exactly what it was, but it was some sort of knockoff brand thing from a site like WL Toys or something like that. 
He ran it in the first qualifier and he didn't finish. It stopped. It didn't look like it was physically broken, but it wouldn't run anymore. I'm not really sure what the issue was. So I immediately went over there and talked to the mom, talked to the son, saw what was going on. And we, to the best of our knowledge, came to the conclusion that there was something wrong with the ESC. Um, we had put a different battery in there to try and get it to go and we checked all the connections, everything seemed good. So I actually ended up taking my personal ESC, putting it in his car, trying my best to get it to go. But despite our efforts, something just didn't work. I don't know if the receiver system didn't like the signal that was being sent to it from the ESC or something like that. I'm not really sure. But we did our best to try and get that kid to be able to continue to race. Um, the kid was very distraught, he was sad, the mom was frustrated, but appreciative that we tried to help him. And then they had a you know discussion with the track owner and tried to figure out how to do this racing thing, but um, I haven't seen them again and I don't think that the shop has seen them again either. So their one and done race experience was abruptly met with failure and frustration. That is what I see happen almost 99% of the time when people try to race something like this. I'm definitely glad that they're there at the track, don't get me wrong. But my issue is that people will watch these videos on the internet, see something like this and go, oh, that's a pretty cheap alternative. And they said that it might be a good race vehicle. I'm gonna get it and give it a try. And then they're immediately met with frustration, zero support from the hobby shop. Nobody in the pits has anything to help them when they break their vehicle. And then they just end up going home kind of bummed out. That's the situation I'm trying to avoid. And I want people to be aware of the shortcomings of vehicles like this and understand what they're truly meant for. This vehicle is disposable. Buy it because you think it looks cool and you can have some fun with it at home, in your yard, at your favorite park, something like that. But it's definitely not something that's going to last forever and it certainly won't bring you some high levels of success at a racetrack. And I don't think that that's its intention, but I just want people to be aware of it. SS, right inside that door. Okay, so here we are in the wonderful SS uh, Hobby Shop, owned by the lovely Susser family. And I want to start this conversation with um, getting some input from them about the situation that they probably see quite often of people looking for something that they can't quite assist with. So I'm not gonna say much more about it, but they have some nice options and some things that we can talk about to get a better solution for people looking to get into RC racing. So, not sure if you guys know from the videos, but Ronnie, the genius behind the operation, <laughs> the SS empire as it were. Um, Ronnie, I wanted to get your thoughts on, is this a scenario that you encounter somewhat regularly when people have a car from these kind of like Hong Kong style websites and then they try to bring them in here and find some help with them. Is that something that you encounter and kind of how does that that's, usually go? That's about once a week. Once, once, <laughs> once a, a week. week, okay. Once a week that happens. Uh, they bought the car internet. Uh, they bought it somewhere else. They got it used. They uh, bought it new from another hobby shop, give or take. Uh, that happens a lot. Something goes wrong, they break, and then there's no parts to fix the car. And then at the end of the day, sometimes it costs more to fix the car than what they paid for originally when they bought the car. Mm, that's true. So uh, we all know that the appeal of the car is that it's like what, like 100 bucks, 120 100 bucks, bucks, something like that. 125, give or take. It has all the bells and whistles it tells you, but it's your bare bone bells and, bells and whistles, as you would say. Right. Uh, one thing that uh, when I was making the video with the car that we saw earlier was. Um, Ronnie's lovely wife, Kim, I had to go over to the timing and scoring booth because I realized that I couldn't even plug in a modern style uh, MyLapse transponder because of the very unique proprietary electronic system. So that was gonna be my other question. When you see these people come in, do you get some questions of how they can upgrade the electronics and start to try and do custom things to well, them? Well, the, the funny thing is most of them, when they do come in, they've already bought it new. They probably played with it two or three times, something went wrong, and they're already wanting to upgrade power, electronics, radio, it happens. Mm. And you have the few that just want to fix what's broke. They have no, they really don't want to race it yet. They're just having fun playing in the backyard, playing on the street or something like that. But once it won a race, 
how fast can they go? They want to buy a, be a better motor, they want to buy a better radio, they want to buy a better steering servo, something as simple as that because you're totally disconnected from a cheap servo to a good servo. And when you look at the money-wise, you can get a $15 servo and you can get a $75 servo that does a real good job. That's really not that bad in the racing part of it. But sure. everybody wants to do something a little bit different. They all don't come in here with the same thing. Same problem when they buy a, 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 a off-brand car, sure. an off-brand car. Same problem there, but some want to go racing, some just want to play, some just want to have fun, or they got it for their son or their daughter or just a family member, and they're just new to it, and they don't understand it yet, but they're getting their feet wet. Sure. Now, I definitely don't want to make people, I don't think Ronnie would either, is that if somebody f sees something that they just like, and they want to go to their favorite park or the front of their house, their backyard, wherever, and just have fun with it, there's nothing wrong with that. You can do whatever you want. I'm trying to insert myself into this conversation. If somebody is wanting to race and they are thinking about making a purchase. So that's kind of where I'm starting this conversation. And I think that Ronnie can help me in creating some possible better <laughs> solutions to things that he can support for the local racer or new person that's getting into the hobby. So that was going to be my next question is first, <laughs> Would you suggest that if somebody wants to race, would you suggest that they get into one of those um, cheaper off-brand cars? Well, there's a fine line there because okay. you, you hurt someone's feelings if it was a gift or they went out and bought it because they spent their money. So you got to be very, very careful with it. It's kind of a, really a fine line. Okay. So you show them an option of the cars that we race. You kind of take them to the track and give them an idea of the track. If they want to get on the track, you allow them to get on the track, and then they see someone who's driving another brand car, kind of get a feel for it. We try not to tell them that the car is not going to do the job in the beginning. We just tell them that you're going to have to put a couple of dollars into it here. You're going to need to upgrade this, upgrade this. You know, normal things are going to be shocks. Normal things are going to be steering servo. Normal things are going to be the battery. Normal things are going to be the motor and speed control. Those are going to be your normal things you're going to need to upgrade. But they cost more to upgrade than the car was when the car was bought originally in most cases. Mm, true, true. Uh, and I appreciate you being sensitive, and I know that's something that um, I'm going to comment on later after the fact, but you do have some options here in the shop. He's got a nice little lovely stock shop here with all kinds of goodies. Um, I'm going to pretend like I'm the, the newbie racer that's coming in to purchase something, and I would love to hear what you would suggest as some kind of current readily available options. I know you have a few, and then perhaps some other options would be like some things that might not be made anymore or something used. I don't know what exactly we have in store, but I'd love to see the direction that you would point a new racer in. New racer. So let's take the scenario that you're a new racer and you do not have an RC car at all. Okay. You have very little experience, but you want to get into it. And you were talking to a buddy who says he has a used one for sale. I'm very careful by trying to tell them, don't buy a used RC car, not unless you have been in it and you know it and you're aware of all of the things. Because you can buy a new one, comes with a warranty, support, part support, and it's brand new. When you buy a used one, you know nothing about it. you got to pay someone like us as a hobby shop or another hobby shop that services for someone to repair this car for you then you're in a jam so right off the bat i try not to talk you into buying a used car i try to tell you be very careful with that then i give you the scenario of the car that you can get bare bone ready to run per se okay and then the kit version which looks the same when you put them side by side you almost have the same feel and look but there's a lot of difference between this car and this car. Sure. There's a lot of difference between this car and this car. This is a ready to run, bare bone, give or take 250, 275. This is a kit car that you're going to build by the same manufacturer associated, which is going to be 350 in the box that comes with no electronics, None of the extra stuff, the servo, it's a kit, you got to build it. So now you're buying motor, electronics, radio, you're buying your steering servo, your tires, your wheels, you got to get your bodies painted, you got to do all this stuff here. 
there's a lot more to it. So that's for the guy for the long haul that's wanting to be a racer, okay. wants to get his feet wet and get started. Because when you build a kit car, you know more about it, you're more into it, you understand it more. You sure. can't understand that because it was already put together. You just can't do that. But there's a place for everybody. Sometimes it is all about how deep you want to go in. If you want to play in the backyard, you just want to go down the road and come back and do a couple of jumps, this is going to be fine. But if you're going to get racing, you got to upgrade. You got to change shocks. You got to change motor. You got to change speed control. You got to change servo. You got to change the wire and the connectors. You got to change your radio, you know, be your, your, your receiver and your radio. You're going to have to change all that. Then if you go racing, you, you got the one thing that everybody struggles with, and that's the transponder that counts your car when it comes to racing. Mm. The handout transponders of the old days is gone. Now everybody has their own transponder with their name on it, their numbers. That's when you're getting serious in racing. Ronnie, I appreciate you. Um, let me come in here and get some advice from somebody who's been in the industry for a very long time. Um, it was very insightful. I appreciate that. And that gives me a little bit different new perspective on how to approach new racers in the industry. Um, definitely just not say mean things about them and their cars because that's not going to help anyone. So, Ronnie, I appreciate you. Um, if anyone wants to come check it out, where, where are you guys? You're in here in Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Three, or, or Tampa, Florida, 6811 East Broadway. That's it. I'll put Florida. I'll put the link down below so you guys can just like map it and Come you won't have to worry about that. Come over here and get some autographs from uh, Kenny and Lee. Kenny and Lee. Lee's over here. Kenny, he's hiding Kenny, back there. Come on over here. Yeah, that, uh, they're trail. usually out here racing when Lee's not out there. You know, going fast at nationals and stuff. But um, awesome time, Ron. Thank you so much. No problem. I appreciate well, it. Good to see everybody. Don't forget, it's a hobby. Make it fun and keep it fun. That is true. Keep it fun, guys. So, all right, I'll see you guys in a second. Guys. I'm not perfect. I'm a human, young kid more often than not. And um, I definitely made a mistake in that last video. Uh, I let my years of racing some top tier stuff and then trying something that's very different, a very cheap alternative. And I just kind of came across like a jerk. So I am genuinely sorry for doing that. I don't want to do that. Um, I could definitely do better than that next time if there is another opportunity, something like this happens. So for anyone that has this car and you felt like I was attacking you personally, I'm definitely sorry that you felt that way. That is not my intention. If you're on the fence about purchasing this vehicle, I hope that this two-part video series is going to be somewhat helpful for you looking at some alternatives if you're gonna get into racing. In conclusion, I guess I can look at this car and say, would I buy it and race it? No, obviously, of course not. Would I suggest it to anyone? I've really been thinking a long time about this and I can say that if you're somebody who has uh, a little kid that's excited about getting their first RC car and for some reason they found one of my videos and they see like my super cool 22X4 and they're like, dad, dad, I want one of those. Can you give me one of those? And then you quickly see some sticker shock and you're like, my goodness, I'm not going to spend that kind of money just to get my kid something that he might not do for more than 30 seconds. But you know what? Maybe I'll find the cheapest thing out there. This looks kind of like it. All right, that'll foot the bill. Because at the end of the day, this thing is a disposable RC car. It's really not meant to last a super long time. It's not meant to be super competitive. It was never intended to do that. I really think that's who it's for. Somebody that just wants to try something for fun, not spend too much money, and they can just give it a shot. A message to the people that are doing tons and tons of videos from these brands, and then give these cars super glowing reviews and perhaps some inflated opinions because you might get a click or two more in your affiliate link down below. Please be a little bit more honest about these vehicles. If somebody takes this to the track, it's almost impossible for them to race it how it comes out of the box based on the things that we talked about. The other vehicles that you might get from these sites, 
If it's a good vehicle, it's a good vehicle, but if there are some problems with it, please do a good job of illustrating how difficult it is to keep some of these vehicles running. I think that there is a large majority of videos out there that are honestly disingenuous about these because they are just wanting people to click the link and buy some so that they can cash a check. I really don't like that idea and I wanna do my best to be as candid and blunt about these as possible so that people can make educated buying decisions. So that's all I have to say about this. I'm not gonna race this thing anymore because I just don't want to. <laughs> but thank you guys for following along. Again, apologies to those that were upset by my first video. Definitely don't want that to happen, but I'm still gonna make RC videos. We're still gonna race. We're still gonna do fun things. So thank you guys for all the comments. I really appreciate it. We are going to learn and move on from this like the adults that we are. Because you know what? I just love RC too much. So we're gonna keep racing and do the thing. Guys, you know what to do. Like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. And I will see you in the next one. Peace.